Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 29th of March, Dutch Bachman is going to wow us with some woven flies. Woven and woven, that sounds really great. The weekly tip, it's going to be thick, thin, healthy, and bent. What is it going to be? Well, you're going to have to stick around to find out. Hi there, I'm Al Beattie, and uh, just reporting uh, on wife Gretchen. She's continuing to recuperate, doing, doing fairly well considering. Anyway, tonight, my, uh, my good friend Dutch Bachman is going to be joining us, and it um, gives me great pleasure to tell you all about him. Now, <laughs> Dutch, his last name is pronounced Bachman, even though you think it's something else, because I've already made the mistake. I do that with words pretty well anyhow. But he began his fly tying journey in 1957. Having no supplies, he tied his first fly on an old rusty hook, thread from Mama's sewing basket, a feather found on the ground, and hair cut from his dog. The fly was magnificent. <laughs> Since that time, he has been mentored by Michael Redensich, Wayne and Wayne Llewellyn, tied with many exceptional tires, and is a proud member of the Roadkill uh, Roundtable Fly Tying Group. It's a group that's been tying on a regular basis since 1972. Dutch is also a proud life member of Fly Fishers International Fly Tying Group and a recipient of the Buzz Busick Memorial Fly Tying Award, the Dick Nelson Fly Tying Award, and the Darwin Atkin Fly Tying Award. Join us tonight in welcoming my good friend, Dutch Bachman. Well, thank you, Al. I appreciate the chance to come back with you all on this side of the vice. And uh, if you want to go ahead, Al, and put that recipe up there. This is the, uh, it's a George Grant uh, fly uh, called the Black Creeper. Uh, the hook is a round bin, uh, 2X long shank, size 8. Uh, and typically, these will go anywhere from about a 6 to a 12. Uh, black thread. The tail is two pieces. It can be three, but tonight, we'll, the second fly we'll tie tonight will have three. The body is black monofilament and orange vinyl that's woven. Uh, the hackle is a moose mane uh, or an elk mane. And the thread uh, or the head is uh, a, a thread head. And the picture you see there on the right is the uh, fly that we'll, we'll dress this evening called the Black Creeper. Um, this fly was designed about uh, 100 years ago. And uh, George Grant uh, claims to be the first person to use monofilament as a body weave or body material. Uh, he also designed this weaving technique, uh, which is very unique, uh, <clears throat> this particular fly. Uh, so the, the body, as you see the tail there, it's uh, two pieces of Tynex. In George's book, he keeps referring to Tynex uh, several times. And um, actually, Tynex is a product made by DuPont. And uh, we know it better as paintbrush bristle. <laughs> and uh, commercial scrub brushes use Tynex as well. So this product is designed to take abuse and to withstand a lot of uh, abuse. Uh, so I thought maybe what George decided that would be a, a good product to use for tail material. And it withstands heavy riffles and banging around in rivers uh, extremely well. Um, the monofilament there is a hairline monofilament. It's round. UTC uh, has one that uh, sometimes you can find it as D-rib, where instead of being round, it's actually flat on one side and mounded on the other side. Uh, that works just fine. I prefer the, the totally round type of monofilament. Uh, George used uh, three strands of floss originally uh, for the body weave for that highlight uh, color and later uh, found a uh, use of vinyl, which we'll use tonight. In this particular pattern, the, uh, the uh, hackle is a woven hair hackle, and, uh, it's, and this one is elk, elk mane, 
And you'll notice on this woven hair hackle, there's long barbs and short barbs. Uh, this is one that George refers as a double hackle. Uh, and it's a technique that you use, you're actually weaving uh, or building the hair sticks and then weaving the hackle. Uh, when you finish the weaving process, uh, the single uh, hackle is made by actually clipping all of the butt ends away from the thread loom, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you just listening to it. But uh, the double hackle is is made by actually cutting the tag ends at about a three eighths inch mark or whatever your desired length would be. Uh, and then um, holding those as hackle. So this, this is the black creeper and uh, we'll start off tonight uh, and we'll use, as I mentioned, a size eight. <clears throat> book. I always flatten the barbs and my, my preference to flatten the barbs is to place a flat edge pliers like this right where the, I, I don't crimp straight down like you often see. I like to go from the side, lay that plier right on the barb location and then hold that firmly and rotate or roll the hook from side to side. And uh, the main right. reason I like to do this is that when I do this rotation kind of thing. When I take it away, I look at where that barb would have been. It's just a rounded place now, uh, especially on heavier hooks. It seems that if I clamp straight down, I may even hear a click, but there can also be little fragments of metal that remain. So this rounding technique seems to eliminate that. Uh, we'll put this firmly into the vise. I like the hook shank to be level. I think it's very important so that we can use the anatomy of the hook to help us in the proportions as we build the fly, or dress the fly. Uh, I, was, I like to point out also, uh, I mentioned this is a 2x long hook shank. Uh, and, and I think fly tires, we get to a point where we understand that uh, a hook shank that's got a longer uh, hook shank is, is we use those for streamers and things like that, but we don't always understand what does that X mean? And uh, essentially uh, every hook manufacturer makes a standard style hook. And the standard hook is one that is two gape widths. The gape width would be from the hook point to the hook shank. That's one. This would be the second. If we put two hooks side by side, we get essentially a two gape length. And from the start of the bend or the end of the hook shank, the hook shank is straight. And right where that starts to curve right here, that's called the start of the bend. If we lay one hook point at the start of the bend and go two widths forward on a standard hook, that eye would be right here. But on this particular Look, if we do the standard measurement like this and measure two eye widths forward, that makes it a 2x. If we had three eye widths forward, that would be a 3x. If we were doing Rangely flies and we had a 9 or 10x hook, that would be 10, would be the standard width and then 10 eye widths forward. So that's that's the reference to. And for thread, um, I only use black or white. Uh, I will have some colored thread occasionally if I need it for, uh, like on a on a Brooks uh, sprout or um, some nymph patterns where they have thread bodies. I will use colored thread, and some of the classic salmon patterns require a classic red head, so I use red thread there. The first element we'll tie in will be back here at the tail. So we'll begin our jam hitch right at the hook point and we'll wrap toward the bend and we'll lay thread wraps down till we get to the start of the bend. And typically on a round bend hook like this one, the start of the bend will be 
normally about directly above where the barb would have been. So right about there is the start of the bend. Another way to, to see that is to lay something flat on the hook shank. And you can see where that begins to bend toward, uh, toward the bend. That, that is the start of the bend. It's important that we stop our thread right about there. And then we want to return the thread back toward the eye, edge to edge, touching wraps to just barely in front of the hook point. Now we're going to use two pieces of Tynex for this tail. Um, just a very simple process to get a paintbrush that has a nylon Tynex bristles and uh, cut the bristles away from the paintbrush. And I store them in a little box. And then, so I'm going to try to get them even, but I can cut them even later. I'm going to lay these on top of the hook shank, side by side, and I get a length of about like that. Grasp them right there on top of the hook shank with a pinch wrap. Come around, straight up, tighten. See how that tail holds straight up? That butt material right here, that pulls straight up. I'm going to now do wraps toward the bend. And I'm going to go until I get to that last wrap of the initial thread on the hook shank. And I'll straighten everything up on top. And at this point, I'm going to flatten my thread, counterclockwise spins uh, to flatten the thread, raise the thread above the hook shank, and as I lower the, reduce the tension on the thread, it'll a loop will jump toward the bend. I'm going to take this and go underneath both both pieces of tail, come forward gently. And slowly just wrap that around the thread wraps, and you'll see those tails kind of fall right in place. Wrap back to that same starting place, right about here. Once again, I'll flatten the thread, lift it up. Now I'm going to, this time I'm going to lower the thread, reduce the tension, and uh, let that loop that forms to go between the two pieces of tail material. And once again, just gently come forward. And as that thread closes between the two tail material, I'll just come around. Now, one thing I'll do right at this point that... Uh, one reason I emphasize that we want to um, start this tail tie-in technique right at the start of the bend. Uh, it's very important. Now, at this point, I'm going to take some UV resin, and I'm going to drop, put one drop of UV resin right where, right not on the thread, but just in front of the thread, on the two pieces of tail material. And as that UV resin grabs those two pieces of tail material. It'll leach onto the hook shank, and at the start of the bend, it's bare. So that will allow it to roll just slightly toward the bend. And when this cooks, secures, what I end up with is a UV bump that's holding both of those pieces of tail material in place. And from the side, you can actually see uh, there's a there's a resin bulb or thread or like a thread bump underneath the two pieces of tail material. We'll come forward just a little bit further. I'm going to come up here to a place that's going to be about 
a quarter of an inch of bare shank now between the thread and the beginning of the hook shank. So right about there. I'm going to start doing a few touching wraps just to really indicate this spot. Uh, everything I do for the body needs to stop by this area right in here. We'll do a few spiral wraps and we'll get covering this area a little bit. You know, come back almost to that same spot. We're going to take this round monofilament. I'm going to allow this monofilament to roll onto the far side. And I'm going to tighten, make thread wraps right back to where that resin ball is, the UV ball. I want to get right snug up to where that ball is, right, right there. I'll take a piece of vinyl. I like this bright orange vinyl. And I'll cut a strip. Uh, oh, that's about an inch and a quarter long, maybe inch and a half would be good. And that's about an eighth of an inch wide. What's interesting is there it looks yellow, but when I tilt it in the light difference, it's uh, that color of orange. And then after I take this piece right here, I'll actually begin to trim this piece. Come on. By cutting, taking scissors and starting down here at the bottom, cutting up to this corner, and then from the same spot, cutting up to that corner. So actually what I've done here is created a taper so that this piece of vinyl is going to be wider at the top than it is at the bottom. Then after I prepared that, it will look like this. I'll turn or invert the vise. I want to try to get this vinyl so that it's really right on the hook, right on the, actually the bottom. You might think of it as the top, but it's the bottom of the hook shank. I want that to be even across there. I'll slide it in just a little. Now, very gently, I'm going to make thread wraps toward the bend. And I'm going to try to keep that final laying right on the bottom of the hook shank all the way down to that same spot where I stopped the monofilament right in front of the thread bump. So right about there. Now this is all going to be bent forward as I do the weave. So I do a little touching edge to edge type wraps up here just to secure it better. And come all the way back to the hook point. And this, this is the weave. The first step is to take the monofilament, go around the hook shank, and come up on this side, lift the vinyl, go underneath, and I want these monofilament turns to be edged edge, so I keep checking periodically, top and bottom. Now when I come I will lay the vinyl forward and continue the wrap of monofilament around the hook shank. And the next one comes up and goes underneath the vinyl. So I'm just going to do this over under kind of weave process all the way across the belly. 
Now, one interesting thing we learn about this is that the we, we know how wrapping a bobbin holder around a hook shank will produce a clockwise twist. And we know that it does the same thing with dubbing loop or a dubbing noodle. This monofilament will also actually retain a twist if I allow it to. Because every one of these turns now is actually putting a twist into the monofilament. So that's nice and even on top. And you have to be kind of gentle with this because that vinyl sure enough will tear. So snug it in there. Let's make one more check. Now there's a nice and tight. And now I'm right about that quarter inch mark right here. So I'm going to return my thread to that stopping spot right there. I'm going to capture the tag ends with the monofilament and the vinyl together. I'm going to a little slot right there. I'm going to put the woven hair hackle. So those are lined up on the bottom. The edges on the side are in line on both sides. So, and the tails are still okay in good shape. Now we're ready for a woven hair hackle. Uh, for this one, I believe, um, let's see, I've got a moose and I've got an elk. For this, for this one, let's go ahead and use the moose woven hair hackle. Coming right off the loom, that's moose hair that I wove into a hackle. And typically what I'll do is I'll lay this on my bench and take a toothbrush and just brush it across there and make those barbs. They're not fibers, they're barbs. Lay those barbs nice and straight. Now we're ready to tie in. I'll take the end of the woven hair hackle with the two knots. See, one end has two knots that are used during the looming process right there. And the other end of the hackle is just a long double piece. That's This is what used to be the, the weaving loom. So I'm going to lay this knotted end across the hook shank. Do holding wraps going forward. And after I begin to trap that tag end, I'm actually now going to lay it back. and wrap over it, going back toward the bend. Here is the tag end of that. We'll carefully remove that. Then we're ready to weave the hackle. You'll notice I have a bare section here between the hackle and the hook shank. And I'll use that just to line it up exactly where I want to begin the weave. As I come around, I'll place finger to hold that in place, grab the, the looming end of the hackle, and just wrap as I would a feather hackle, edge to edge going forward. This point I can wrap toward the eye. I do two turns of thread tying thread around the tag and go that puts a half hitch in there and I'm going edge to edge back toward the bend. I can remove that.
And the advantage of the woven hair hackle is uh, when this hackle gets wet, it stays away from the hook shank just like that. It does not collapse around the body of the fly and uh, really gives a nice, uh, lots of movement. So to build the head, I'll go to the eye. And on some flies, when we get to this point, there's there can be butt ends of feathers or different things in here that we have to account for as we're building the head. And uh, what I typically will do now is start at the eye and do edge to edge, tight, edge touching wraps from the eye going toward the bend. Back down and I'll come back again. At this point, I'll do a proper whip finish, meaning the vertical portion of the whip finish right there is going to, that it'll go right at the edge of the material and I'll do edge to edge turns going toward the eye. I don't overlap the preceding wraps. Close it, seat it. Now to finish the head, uh, I like to use this product called Healthy Hoof instead of Head Cement. Um, head Cement, um, uh, commercial Head Cement, Sally Hansen's Heart is Whole, they all have the same formula, uh, a bunch of acetone. And this one, this has acetone as well, but it also has a few other ingredients that uh, really make a difference. And what will happen now with this is... Um, I'll just put a, a drop here and a drop there. I'll leave it upside down. Uh, and also, I, on anything that's got a bristle like this, as soon as I get it, I cut out about 80% of those bristles. Uh, this is a quick drying product. Um, and the, one of the advantages I see in this is that um, it's very, very durable for sure, but uh, it'll leach into that thread and, and it dries and bonds kind of within the thread. Uh, then last step is this is UV resin. Put one drop right there, cook it. I'll do another drop. That's that is beautiful. Well, thank you, thank you, Al. Um, I would uh, prefer a little better looking tackle, but that, that'll that work just fine. The, the, the beauty of it is that it, uh, like I said, when this gets wet, uh, that hackle stays away from the hook shank and is just constantly moving. And uh, if we roll it over, we can see the weave on the belly. And it's, I've tied a lot of these Dutch with, um, with embroidery yarn for the interwoven orange. And when you get them wet, they kind of, take on the color of the stuff around them. And I'll bet you that vinyl stays nice and bright. That's exactly right, Al. That, that's the point of why I selected this vinyl. Yeah. Uh, that's precisely why. And uh, I, I like that contrast. And after fishing, and these are such durable flies, that after a day of uh, hopefully lots of fish hitting it, uh, those colors stay very vivid like that. Uh, as you begin to dress these flies, one of the things you kind of look for or you get particular about is it gets kind of technical sounding maybe, but this spot right back here, um, 
there's a lot going on right there. And as you begin to dress these flies, uh, you'll notice as you finish one, that's a spot that will catch your eye uh, if you weren't really careful. Uh, because you've got that resin bump under there, but you, the relationship of that first wrap of monofilament to the first fold of vinyl is is crucial. Um, and so you have to take great care in, in getting that part of it uh, just right. Uh, Franz Pott is a guy that developed the woven hair hackle. He was a wig maker that migrated from Germany to uh, Hamilton, Montana, and however that happens, I don't know, but somehow he got from Germany to uh, Hamilton, actually a little town south of Missoula, Hamilton, Montana, and um, he 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 saw his friends fishing uh, hackled uh, flies, and they would talk about the great movement in their patterns until they saw it in the water, and that, that feather barbs would collapse around the body of the fly and then they didn't have any movement. Franz said, well, I think I can fix that. Uh, and what he did was actually take hair and weave it as he would a wig. And uh, Franz Pott had a three thread weaving loom that uh, he was, it was more than proprietary. Mm -hmm. He was just a grumpy fellow that wouldn't tell people uh, what he was doing and nobody knew how he did it. And uh, for years, George Grant, who had a fly shop in Butte, and others studied what Franz Pott did to weave these hackle, and they, they couldn't figure out how he used a three-thread loom. Uh, so uh, George developed the method to use a two-thread loom, which everybody that does these uses that style today. But the end result is exactly the same. Uh, the hackle stays away from the hook shank just like this one. It's even in the strongest whiff, riffles, stays away like. But so you use thread and you weave uh, sticks or pieces of hair into this loom. And uh, typically they're about, uh, I'll say, three quarters of an inch wide. And the beauty of it is as you're weaving hair, uh, you can actually uh, make the length of the hair this the length of the hackle to be whatever length you want it to be. You can be very precise. These are extremely durable. Uh, when George Grant had his fly shop, he would sell these 35 cents a piece or three for a dollar, which was a premium back in those days. And you can fish these essentially uh, many, many ways. You can cast upstream and do a dead drift. Uh, they will saturate and sink. You can swing them. You can quarter downstream. Uh, you can fish them a lot of different ways. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I had the pleasure to tie at the Oregon uh, Fly Tying Expo a couple of weeks ago. And I actually made a fly just like this one, but I built the hackle to be about three inches long. And I put it on a two odd hook. Uh, and I went after some steelhead, and to see this in the water was just absolutely remarkable. Uh, but I, uh, in that case, I, I quartered downstream and swung it to the bank, as you would typically for for steelhead. But this was in some really fast moving water and, and so forth. But I like to I, I have some of these I, I actually do for bass, where the, instead of this uh, orange treatment there. I can I have some chartreuse vinyl, and I've got uh, a piece of what's called polar chenille that I can uh, weave into this, and, and the bass just absolutely love that. So I can adapt it to local species. Okay, the dynamite is uh, also um, George Grant uh, no, excuse me, the, the, the dynamite is actually a Franz Pot uh, fly pattern. Uh, his sandy mite was uh, the famous one, but uh, he did one using a little bit different color material and it became the dynamite, but it's using a similar kind of hook, round bend, uh, 2X length uh, size. Uh, for this one, I, I'll go for anywhere from like a 6 to a 12 um, but once again, black thread, uh, two strands of Tynex, uh, and I use 
tail hair. The Gemsbach is a South African antelope. It's bigger than a horse. I'll show it to you when we get back on camera, but it's it's big. And, and I'll explain why I, I like that kind of hair. But it, horse hair or anything long uh, works just fine. Uh, and the hackle, the, 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 we'll put an elk mane on this one tonight. I think that's moose mane you see in the picture. And the head is is thread. Uh, now on the, this has the two tails, as you saw before. Same kind of technique to tie those in. But this has the pot's body weave. And we'll actually weave this body uh, just like... Um, pots did and then the hackle is a woven hair hackle and this one is uh, moose okay yeah. and once again we're going to use the uh, monofilament thread and once again we'll start back here about the hook point and, you know, one thing I've learned is it, 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 it seemed like when I would, this area right in here, we drew a straight line from the hook point to the hook shank. All this area right in here is called the throat. And I used to think that when we're working in the throat, we would want to keep the bobbin holder short like this so we could stay inside there and do this. And that, that works just fine. Uh, but I've noticed also I can have a longer piece and go at an angle, and I use the tag end so that every wrap goes onto the tag end and slides down. And so I get that right in the slot where I want it, and I avoid that hook point by doing this. But once again, we'll go all the way back to about the start of the bend. Then we'll come back to the starting place right there, right about the hook point. And we'll get two more pieces of tie necks. When you, when you take these off of a paintbrush, you'll see one end will be kind of gnarly looking like that. And so if you turn them around, you'll get a nice tip that you can use for the tail. And I'm going to try to get one drop right between, getting low on resin there. There. Did you see how that slid in? I grabbed a hold of both pieces of that material and it kind of slid into the start of the bend. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Because that's once that cooks, that's what forms that little ball underneath the two pieces of tail material. I like the... Uh, Deer Creek, it's a solar res kind of resin. I just found out that uh, evidently folks have uh, some allergy or they have a reaction to uh, resins. So Deer Creek has just come out with one they called, uh, or solar res came out with one they called Deer Creek Plus. And the Deer Creek Plus resin has reformulated uh, to eliminate whatever it was that was causing the uh, allergen reaction. So we don't need these. So I'm going to come forward now. And I need edge to edge tightening kinds of wraps till I get up to about that quarter inch spot once again. Let's see how close we are there. Now I'm going to do tightening wraps, or excuse me, holding touching wraps. I need to have a thread base for this next weave we're going to do. Uh, because if you're not careful, a big risk in the pot's body weave is the, the torque of actual doing the weave can cause the material to spin around the hook shank. And I like to just take a little bit of my cobbler's wax. Okay. 
Yeah, don't use glue. So now the tail is Gemsbach. And um, this is how you spell Gemsbach if you want to look it up. G-E-M-S-B-O-K. But it's a South African antelope. And uh, the tail, the tail hair is not too coarse. But the thing I like about it a lot is the uniform length I can get uh, from the tail. Hair, horse hair works just fine. But on some horse hair, you're going to see a lot of uh, irregularities in the length of the hair strands. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll cut out of that uh, tail a bundle about like this. Now, this, this too might sound just a little bit anal, but there's about 30 strands. And I say 30 because a couple of things I realized that the thickness of the width I can get on this weave is just about, where is it here? There. I get the width I, I'm looking for. So I cut that butt flush straight. And without messing up my tail, I'm going to lay this in place, do a pinch wrap, back that up just a little, catch it with a loop, go forward to secure it, edge to edge tightening wraps nice and secure. And now I can go upright again. And I'm going to lay that here. As you see, it's on the far side of the hook shank. So I'm going to do not necessarily touching wraps, but not big spiral wraps. I want it nice and tight and secure on the far edge, on the far edge of the hook shank. I'm not messing up my tail. I'm going to wrap this. So in this case, I want to wrap just a little bit more going toward the bend. And I want to leave a space now that's going to be about between the ball or the tail tie-in and where this ends. Uh, that space right in there, I want that to be about the width of my hair bundle. And here I'm going to do some some edge-to-edge -edge wraps going back toward the eye. And the reason for that is as we start the weave, I'm going to be moving this around. And if, and if the hair is not secure right there, it'll slide around. And that also uh, adds to the problem of spinning around the hook shank, which is a real no-no. We'll come back up like this. That's on the side. Now we turn, we invert this. And I take a piece of uh, embroidery floss. And this is a long piece of floss to unwind. So I think in the essence of time here, I'm just going to go ahead and and uh, use this whole piece. A little bulky, but I think you can see it better. So lay this it's called a thread trap where you can secure material on a hook shank without any thread wraps. Secure it right here. Come back over those tag ends, make it pretty. Just to keep everything nice and secure. Now, a lot of you can, if you're just learning this technique, you can actually uh, do a whip finish and take your thread, your bobbin holder off uh, because it is kind of cumbersome as we're doing the weave. Um, but uh, for tonight, I'll just leave it on. The first thing we're going to do is take this hair and throughout the weave, I want to try to keep this hair uh, flat like this. And now the first thing I'm going to do is come around the hook shank flat and straight up. Now, this is when we start the weave. 
orange goes around the base of the hair, snugs it in, then around the hook shank, straight up, switch it, keep tension on both of them, and roll the hair back over the hook shank and come up this side. Snug it around the base, go around the bottom, around the hook shank, switch, roll the orange toward the bend, continue the hair around the hook shank. Base, hook shank, between, roll it. Now, this is the crucial step for running out of hook space. So the, the, to finish this off, to finish the weave, this is a crucial step right there. That orange has to go around the hook shank and snug it in, but we don't go around the hook shank. We we'll lay the hair over, catch the hair, and now I'm doing touching wraps toward the bend. And normally, this is a 2x hook, a 3 or 4 uh, works pretty good. You got a little more space, you can actually get more weaves in. I think it looks pretty good. Now here we're going to hold this back, get some thread in front of it. That that step right there is, in my opinion, the trickiest part of a body weave is getting that tied off properly so it doesn't explode. Because that's a lot of tension right there. Okay, now I've got a good platform, <clears throat> good platform here to tie in the woven hair hackle. Bring this up, everything in order. So this is the elk woven hair hackle. I tie it in right there. You can see the knotted ends to the right. I'm doing edge to edge wraps, so not up to the eye. I'm saving that space. Hold this back. Three times around the tying thread, that makes a half hitch going up, edge to edge. Once again, start the head at the eye, edge to edge wraps going toward the bend. Okay, well, then uh, we're going to be moving on to the weekly tip. And, uh, you know, Dutch is actually responsible for part of that, too. But I'm going to, I'm going to do it for him, and, <laughs> uh, and, and, and we'll talk about it. Now, here's the way the weekly tip started. 
a good friend of mine, Sherry Steele, contacted me and she's this last week and said, Al, I um, left the cap off of my healthy hoof and now it's all thick. What what can I do? What do I thin it with? I So in my response back to her, I copied Dutch because I was kind of talking through my hat, quite frankly. And I said, <laughs> for me, toluene is everything. And if it don't work, then you throw it away and start over. That's what I've been doing. I've been doing that my whole life. Well, anyway, Dutch chimed in. And so tonight's tip is going to be part of what we were talking about earlier. Thick, thin, healthy, and bent. Now, we haven't got to the bent part yet, but the thick and thin is going to be um, discussed, well, right about now. Healthy hoof. And I, and I just call it H hoof on this uh, slide so I can save space for some other words. But as Dutch said earlier, healthy hoof, hoof, Sally Hansen's, hard as whole, and, and some others, they're all the same ingredients. In addition, though, healthy hoof also has MEK, which is methyl ethyl ketone. It also has a couple other things. Correct me when I say this wrong, Dutch, but anyway, to solidamide and formaldehyde resin. Yes, that's correct. And uh, to thin the healthy hoof, coming down through all of this information that you really didn't need in the first place, all you need to do to thin healthy hoof is acetone or isopropyl alcohol. But anyway, my thanks to Dutch for that first part. But then David Crawford sent me something that I have to to share with you all. And let me move back to right here. All right, we're looking at, at the wide shot of my, my setup, and I wanna point out something to you. What we have here is the camera, and that's a Macos camera. A lot of people are using them now. And one of the things about the Macos is over here on this side, you see there's a cord there comes up, goes into the camera. And there, in fact, there's another slot up there above as well. But we're only concerned about this bottom slot, which is an HDMI cable. And I want you to know that that kind of loops out there. And I cannot tell you how many times I have bumped that darn thing. And then I have to say to you guys, oh, I'm sorry. I just bumped the camera out of whack. Now I've got to move it back. Well, it's because of that doggone cord. And it's, quite frankly, drove me nuts. Thank you to David Crawford because we're going to take a look now at a recommendation that he sent to me. He said, we've been having that same trouble, and we found a, a, a fix for it, and here it is on Amazon. And in fact, if you're interested, I put the link in Amazon. And if you happen to be a person who does presentations on Zoom and your cord gets in your way, all you have to do is get these little 90-degree turns I got four of them on order. I got four cameras, and it was less than 10 bucks. As you can see, the price there, and then there'd be taxes and all that junk. But anyway, it's about $7.50, give or take. Okay, now here is David's travel setup, because he travels with his Macos camera quite a bit. And I'm just going to point out that, now there's the camera you saw sitting on the tripod doing its job there. Well, he's now ready to travel and notice that's just plugged right in the side there. And uh, one of the things you also gain if you're traveling a lot is you're plugging cords in and out of that HDMI port on that camera. And this takes away a lot of wear because you're going in and out of a, a cheap, inexpensive uh, an adapter that if you need to replace it, you sure can. But anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. And the last tip, I wasn't even gonna do that until just now, but he said he gets his case to, for, the, for the camera at Harbor Freight. I've gotten more than a few cases at Harbor Freight and they range from $19 to about 50 bucks. So we only do this about once a quarter, but part of the way we keep, we're able to continue to afford to do all of this is we do pretty good on our book sales. And you'll find those books available at btsflyfishing.com up there uh, under the, uh, on the left. And on the right is my email address or you go to Amazon. Those are the books that we have available. We appreciate if you plan on doing some fly tying and you need some information for a particular discipline in fly tying, at least check us out before you go somewhere else. Give us a chance. And quite frankly, uh, given that I don't have to only advertise this about once a quarter, uh, my book sales have been very good. 
my thanks to all of you out there in, in viewer land. Yes, folks, it's now sharing time again on BT's Fly Tying Friday. Here is the first one. Awesome. <laughs> Looking good. Beautiful. She's even got the orange in the right places, Dutch. <laughs> and here is the second one. Oh, wow. Good job. Well, you captured the captured that one very well. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Evelyn. Anything else that you want to share? So I have 65 of these uh, things done. Okay. Uh, this this came up because uh, when when we were doing some uh, CDC flies in our in our group, a lot of folks did not have the uh, Mark Pettijohn magic tool. Okay. These are, uh, this is the table and, and this is the clip that come with the uh, Pettijohn magic tool. And you can get, uh, you can get plastic knockoffs on Amazon. Uh, these, these clips, there's a, a five, five clip set from this large one to this small one that is uh on listed on amazon and this is this is a uh i don't know if you can see the yeah there you can see the uh cdc that's in that clip okay to be able to use those those other uh plastic knockoffs you can you can take and Cut some foam. They can be pulled out with a clip and then trimmed and placed into a uh, a dubbing loop. And these are these are all inexpensive. And if you don't have a magic magic kit or magic tool and you don't want to do the expense of buying one, uh, these these work adequately for occasional use. It has to do with that uh, healthy hoof. The last uh, part of it is healthy hoof lacquer. And what do you thin lacquer with? Lacquer thinner. And oh. if you look at the chemical composition of lacquer thinner, you'll see some of that mech stuff and whatever. But anytime you're reading a chemical label, if you see the last two letters uh, being an OL, that's an alcohol. And so usually an alcohol will thin a compound that contains an alcohol. So uh, I thin my healthy hoof with uh, just a uh, just a syringe, no, no just a eyedropper of, of, uh, of uh, lacquer thinner. I was having a little bit of troubles holding on and grabbing into a uh, little fine thing. And I found by using that little piece of bead foam, I can slide it and I can make the tip hold tighter. Can I put bead foam in there? Sure you oh, do. Yeah, you're, you're, you're applying, applying pressure on, on the tip, pushing it tighter shut. Yeah. And you can almost use it for a set of hackle pliers. And so that's what I've used when I've got something that's really pernicious that I can't uh, seem to get the tip to hold on to it. So that creates just a little bit extra wedge and you don't deform um, the metal. Hey, thanks a lot. That's a, that's a good idea. Anything else? Uh, yes. I ran into this. This is called string silencer. Okay. And it's used on bow string and it's very, very fine micro round uh, silicone. You can get it in lots of different colors. They make it into 13. And I've been playing around with it. And what it does is it's got little individual sections, if you can see right there, that you can actually tear it apart. So you can create your own little segmented sections like that. Hey, great. Anything else, yeah. Bill? No, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. For now, it's a wrap. Until next week, 